Hello everyone. In this uh, talk, I'm going to take you through all the steps that are involved in surgical correction of AIS. So to, to begin with, preoperatively, you want to explain wake up test uh, to the patient because you are going to do intraoperative neuromonitoring. Most of the time wake up test is not required during the surgery if there are no alerts. But if you um, end up having an alert and you have gone through the whole checklist, then the last thing you want to do is a wake up test. And for that, the prerequisite is that you have to explain this to the patient before the surgery. For a usual AIS patient, I usually reserve one packed RBC. Make sure that you have taken the clinical photographs of the patient before surgery and the patient is adequately consented and consented along with the parents. So before uh, the positioning, uh, get baseline MEP and SSCP. Make sure that you have adequate monitorable signals that can be monitored throughout the surgery. This is before the patient is turned uh, prone. And I would uh, point your attention to this chart. Uh, this I have put it up in the uh, bonus material. You can download it and keep it with you. Um, I Many times what we do is print this uh, chart and put it up on the OR wall. And this helps each member of the team uh, to, to take part in an alert if there is a respond to the alert if there is any alert during the surgery. Like, uh, you know, these are the things that the surgeon has to do. These are the things that the anesthetist has to do. This is what the technician or the neurophysiologist will do. And, you know, here you can see that there is a wake up test here if you are having ongoing considerations. So this is a good checklist that helps you respond to an interoperative neuromonitoring alert. And it's worth keeping up with you. Uh, these patients are catheterized. I usually start these patients on tranexamic acid, uh, which is the dose is 20 milligram per kg bolus, and then 10 milligram per kg per hour infusion continues throughout the surgery. Antibiotics are given according to the protocol. And if it's a long surgery, you redose at four hours or after a one liter of blood loss. Positioning of the patient, uh, we do this on a Jackson table, or if you don't have on a regular table, make sure that you have a chest pad like this. Now these chest pads are important because this promotes thoracic kyphosis by pushing the chest uh, this way. As you know, AIS are hypokyphotic patients. You make sure that all the bony prominence, uh, prominences are well padded. And the head is positioned on a foam uh, 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 device or sometimes if the surgery is very long, then we like to position the patient on a Mayfield or a Gardner Wells to take the pressure off the eyes completely. Now, after you have positioned the patient in the prone position, you check your intraoperative inter neuromonitoring signals again and make sure that you are getting good signals. After that, uh, start with the exposure. I routinely infiltrate the skin before taking an incision. The incision is slightly curvilinear, not as much as the deformity somewhere in between. Then you do a good subperiosteal exposure. At the time of the subperiosteal exposure, the mean arterial pressures are usually 60. We ask the anesthetist to keep it a little low and you give short term muscle paralysis and that is okay during the exposure. <clears throat> as you progress with the exposure, use a roller gauze pack. As you keep on going forward, this will prevent uh, excessive blood loss and always, always stay subperiosteal. And it's important not to get too much of blood loss during this stage of the surgery. Your exposure has to be from the tip of the TP to tip of the TP on the other side. Don't do a half-hearted uh, exposure and not expose the TP completely because if you don't expose the TP uh, completely, you will not get good anatomical landmarks and also you won't get a good muscle cover over your implant because the muscle flap needs to be raised and it has to go over the uh, screws. So if you don't go till the tip of the TP, you are going to have a lot of dead space in between. So take care not to damage the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments at the top two levels. So somewhere at the top two levels, you don't want to get into the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments. Preserve that because those Structures are important uh, for the adjacent segment and you want to avoid a proximal junctional kyphosis there. So don't damage the midline structures in the upper two segments. 
always have an adequate length of exposure your incisions usually are very long so there is no point cheating at the ends i have seen a lot of people struggling because they want to keep their incision smaller and then undermine at the edge of the uh, skin and try to take a, a muscular uh, exposure much longer than what the skin will allow and this is <clears throat> this is not very useful and <clears throat> most importantly it compromises the uh, uh pedicle screw insertion at at the top so if you don't have a good exposure you might make errors in putting these screws at the top and remember that your ends of your construct the anchors are most important so don't cheat at the ends for your exposure have a generous exposure uh, make sure that you have enough room to plan your screw and uh, insert your screw and then pulling and pushing on that skin incision can lead to a very bad scar and at at the end so don't undermine your exposure just because you want to keep the length of your incision short this incision is long anyway and you want to keep it cosmetic by not damaging the uh, edges of of the skin right so then the next step is pedicle marking so we usually whatever is the lower end approximately uh, i choose a particular uh, pedicle level and then uh, take the entry point and pass a screw and this is to confirm our level so i insert one screw to check level and then you take an x ray at this point and it will tell you whether this vertebra is t12 or t11 or whatever uh, that is so um, use the pedicle screw only as a, a marking point for your uh, uh, for your vert uh, vertebral levels remember that the vertebral levels are checked uh, or decided your uiv and liv are decided on the basis of x ray and not on the basis of how the curvature is uh, intraoperatively so if you find intraoperatively something is becoming neutral that is not your lower end vertebra the lower end vertebra is always radiographic and it is decided pre op and it is not decided intraop so you have to get a check x ray to determine your uh, fusion levels then uh, coming to the next part of the surgery the next part of the surgery is uh, is basically you want to see what releases that you need to do by this time your map has to be higher uh, about 80 to uh, 85 uh, mm of mercury make sure your anesthetist know this beforehand and you have explained to the anesthetist that you want uh, the mean arterial pressures below this th above this threshold uh during this the main part of the surgery now remember what the release is doing uh to the spine uh, in ais you want to lengthen the posterior column because only if you lengthen the posterior column are you going to get kyphosis you want to correct the scoliosis bring the apex as close to the midline as possible but also you want to lengthen the posterior column so that you generate kyphosis and correct the hypokyphosis so the simplest release that everyone does is to remove the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments at all levels except at the top levels which as i said before uh, you want to preserve now the second part also everyone does that's a grade 1 osteotomy means an inferior facetectomy at all levels now an inferior facetectomy is required not only for fusion uh, but it is also required for identifying the entry point of the pedicle screws so your entry point requires you to expose the superior facet of the thoracic vertebra for that you have to do an inferior facetectomy so uh, that also takes uh, 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 that also allows uh, for a good fusion bed to occur at the facet side so you either use a 10 mm osteotome to cut the inferior facet or also you can use bone scalpel or mesonics and this causes less ble bleeding if you use something like that but not all hospitals have this ultrasonic uh, bone scalpel facility the third is actually the thing that is optional which is the grade 2 uh, posterior column osteotomy or commonly known as the ponti osteotomy now the ponti osteotomy uh, is the the pros of it are it allows for a better sagittal restoration 
because by doing a ponte osteotomy you can lengthen the posterior column remember the ponte osteotomy initially was described for shortening the posterior column but you can also use it for lengthening the posterior column so it can afford a better sagittal restoration and it can also afford a better cop correction uh, of the scoliosis but the problems are that it causes more blood loss it increases your surgical time and because you are going to expose the dura and the spinal spinal cord right here in the midline is vulnerable uh, to problems and you can you have a higher chance of getting an intraoperative neuromonitoring alert with ponte osteotomy so the routine use of ponte osteotomy is controversial you don't need to use it for every single case of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis so you can see here how the ponte osteotomy looks here uh, the interspinous is removed ligamentum flavum is removed the superior facet and the inferior facet is removed on both sides so basically this is there is a complete disconnection of the posterior uh, elements uh, at uh, at these levels so this is uh, the ponte osteotomy so which play in which are the cases where you would do a ponte osteotomy so if you have a very hypokyphotic uh, thoracic spine less than 10 degrees and you want to restore uh, the thoracic kyphosis uh, then you can choose to do something like that or if your primary cob angle is large you have a large rigid curve and you want to increase the flexibility of the curve and make it more supple uh, then also you can use a ponte osteotomy so the ponte osteotomy is a useful uh, osteotomy not only for making a rigid curve more flexible but can be also used to correct a very hypokyphotic uh, thoracic spine Uh, into normal kyphosis but this is not something that is routinely done for all ais patients and uh, you know i i generally like to do the ponte osteotomy before putting in the screws because the screw tulips are going to come in your way of your osteotomy uh, another better way of doing is is to prepare your screw holes tap them and bone wax them at least at the apex and then do the ponte osteotomy and once after doing the ponte osteotomy just put in the screws so that probably is a better way of doing it uh, than than doing ponte osteotomy first and then putting in the screws so either way whatever suits it's not like the ponte osteotomy is impossible if you put in the screw screws in first it it's a personal choice but i feel that sometimes the tulips can get in your way of a very easy decompression especially if you have a larger curve and you are trying to disconnect these facets in the concavity of the curve and then you have the tulip sitting here and then you don't have enough room in the concavity at the at the apex so that's about ponte osteotomy not something that is routinely done for all ais but it's an option if you have a very hypokyphotic apex or if you have a relatively rigid um, uh, uh, cur curvature and your residual bending is more than 40 degree and you want a more more curvature uh, correction uh, at least so the instrumentation strategies like we discussed uh, in the last talk there are various different instrumentation strategies uh, some people like to put all screws on the concavity and put convexity screws only like this some people are using apical key vertebra uh, ends four screws and apical some key vertebra Uh, some are using something like this uh, rarely some people use screws at all levels but this is very expensive to use and i am not sure uh, what additional benefit doing screws at all levels uh, does i mean if somebody says that you prevent pseudo arthrosis by doing something like this i mean with with lesser screws also the pseudo arthrosis rate is really really low some people like to use something like this uh, all screws in the concavity and a little bit more screws on the convexity but concentrated at the apex i like this kind of uh, construct many times for the flexible ones and my implant density usually changes depends on the rigidity of the curve but most of the typical ais patients are quite flexible so something like this works quite well in my hand and uh, i try to put these screws alternate like this and make a construct here and here so that's that's my preference and uh, there's another strategy here screws at all levels and then here you are putting alternate screws at, on the convexity so there's no particular good answer for this that what you should do 
i feel that you have to individualize this somebody who is quite rigid and you want more correction might require many more screws and some somebody who is quite flexible can do with a lesser implant is density as well and can do quite well right so uh, this we have discussed implant density depends on the inherent flexibility of the curve and definitely it's not required to go to full implant density of 2.0 for every uh, patient so what are the principles you want good anchors at the upper end vertebra and lower end vertebra typically four at the top and four at the bottom or at least three at the top and three at the bottom so you want good anchors there apical concavity you want to put enough screws because that is the uh, con, uh, apex that you want to pull out of the thorax remember it is hypokyphotic so if it is in the concavity you want to pull it out so you want more anchors there the convex side apex you want to push down so you need to have some screws on the convex apex and then you want to put screws somewhere in between intercalary to improve the fusion so these are the corrective steps this is what i do i think we have uh, gone through these steps uh, uh, yesterday as well in the previous talk so again i'll repeat vertebral translation using <coughs> a concave uh, over contoured rod <coughs> which has a differential rod contouring and then fine tuning is done using dvr if required and then segmental concave distraction and fine tuning as per uh, needed so here you can see that um, let's we have already show i've shown you this yesterday let me take you to the steps of the surgery here so this is a, a scoliosis patient here you know um, that's the curve 76 degrees so this is the curve that we are going to correct like that and so here you can see that this is the screw here on which i am checking the level and making sure that what my liv is correct or not doing facetectomy at every level to expose the superior facet which helps me put the screws at every level right so here in this patient i have i have skipped some uh, areas where i have not put in screws notice that i have put all reduction screws on the concavity right this is the upper end vertebra this is the lower end vertebra lower instrumented vertebra now this is the rod that is over contoured over contoured to in the th uh, concavity this is the lumbar area that's why this is flatter it is a little flatter here so you can see the rod here is a little flatter or for the lordotic this is over contoured and the ap apical thoracic uh, proximal thoracic contouring is more or less same between the convex and uh, uh, concave rod and here you want to keep enough proximal part kyphosis to avoid pjk you cannot keep this straight if you keep this straight you will get a pjk so uh, the convex rod is relatively flat like this and make sure that the rod has a hex end at the at the bottom so th there is a hex and on which the wrench goes which keeps the rod in a perfect alignment as you bring the spine towards the rod remember that when you are measuring this rod measure the length longer than your measurement because as you correct the spine is going to lengthen and your rod will fall short if you go right from this end to this end so keep a little bit longer about 2 cm longer than what exactly you measure because as you correct the scoliosis it has to accommodate that length lengthening so use bending use a table top bender or a french bender i usually don't like to use a french bender because it notches the rod at multiple levels i i use inside to benders to make one smooth curve and make sure that you are keeping a, the laser etching now all most of these rods have a line that is drawn on the top of the rod make sure that that line always is dorsal so you will you will not bend the rod in different planes if you always keep a watch on that line and that la that laser etching that is there on the rod also you try to keep it always uh, facing dorsally while you are correcting it so that you can keep the rod in perfect sagittal alignment as the correction happens so you see that there is a hex wrench here which is uh, keeping this rod in the uh, sagittal profile 
uh, and you ask your assistant to keep it like that there will be a line on this rod uh, you can't see it on this picture but there is a laser line on it make sure that laser line is always dorsal so you will come to know that you have put this rod in the correct alignment lock this screw after locking this screw you will have the rod that is sitting outside and then uh, uh, away from these reduction screws then start putting screws here then start put screws here and here then put here and here and keep on coming closer to the apex so you will notice that automatically the spine starts moving towards this uh, over contoured rod and the scoliosis corrects so here you can see that the spine has moved towards the rod uh, using these reduction screws you have translated the rod uh, translated the spine towards the rod so i have not used a rod rotation maneuver i have used a vertebral translation maneuver and mind you different people correct this deformity differently some people like to use rod rotation maneuver some people like to use double rod rotation maneuver so there are various ways of treating it the idea is to get a good end end result it's not like one thing is wrong and the other thing is correct it's a personal preference and how you have learned the procedure also is uh, important and you will see on the first day of our course dr ito is going to show a double rod rotation maneuver where he'll correct these curves a little differently than what uh, what i am showing you so here you'll see now at this point in time this screw is tightened all these screws are loose so you don't want to tighten them except for this so you want to keep this tightened so that this rod does not uh, change its rotation so keeping this locked this rod will maintain its rotation only thing that these nuts are kept loose now you want to keep these loose because you are going to use the convex rod to push down on the apex uh, on the other side uh, and you won't be able to do that you won't be able to de rotate the vertebra if you have locked this whole uh, assembly on this side so only lock the lower one and keep the rest of it loose and then start from the proximal end the convex rod again it's a cobalt chrome rod on the convex side you tighten at the proximal end and this is an under contoured rod so this is flatter than your expected thoracic kyphosis that you want to achieve so you lock this and then as you keep going down keep on locking it so what will you will see that this rod will stick away from the screws here and you want to cantilever it down by doing this you are also pushing down on the apex and causing the vertebral body to rotate de rotate like that that means this concave pedicle will move out of the chest and convex pedicle will be pushed down and that causes the de rotation of the vertebra so here finally you are locking this and then you can lock it then you can see that the vertebral rotation has been corrected like that now if you want to do further uh, de rotation correction then you can use dvr to correct even more or any fine tuning that you want to do you can use compression and distraction at these uh, segmental levels now remember that you want to use concave side distraction more in the thoracic spine because distraction in the thoracic spine will induce kyphosis in the sagittal plane so you don't want to use compression maneuver on the convexity side as your primary means of correcting the cob angle because that will reduce your kyphosis i hope that is clear so dr lonstein who was my mentor always used to say surgery starts now so a lot of people give a lot of attention to the um, instrumentation but forget that the surgery is actually a fusion surgery so you need to decorticate it well and lay good bone graft M many times i will use uh, the bone graft that is harvested locally mixed with aloe graft um almost never use uh, autograph from a separate incision from ilac crest for ais patients usually i try to mix it with either synthetic uh, graft as bone extender or use aloe graft mixed with local locally harvested bone graft from the spinous process and then you do a good closure and it's important that you do a very good subcute subcute subcuticular closure because these are cosmetic surgeries and and remember that if you do too much retraction at the end this is what will happen you will get um, all this uh, 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 edges will get uh, injured and this leads to quite bad scar 
especially just uh, below uh, the neck region uh, and that is visible especially in girls you know uh, 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 it is visible outside their dress because the rest of it is covered by their clothes so that is about the surgery always take a long cassette x-ray so this these are the kind of x-rays i like to take during the uh, after the surgery after the surgery in siam it is very difficult to understand the alignment of the uh, spine so you want to take an uh, x-ray that uh, intraoperative x-ray that shows a bigger picture than just a siam picture that shows uh, a very small area so i always like to take intraoperative uh, long cassette x-rays we don't really have long cassettes in the uh, in the or for us uh, but i use a usual regular uh, cassette and still try to get a long uh, long film uh, as much as uh, it allows so that is it about ais correction um, and hopefully using this information you can answer some of the questions that are asked in the classroom thank you very much